The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Tracy and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, thank you for joining us. Uh, boy, another fantastic show lined up for you today. A very popular and growing area of ETFs is something called Smart Beta. These are ETFs that select and weight their holdings by something other than market cap. This is actually the fastest growing segment of ETFs. And there are many different flavors of Smart Beta ETFs out there. But we're going to focus today on what are called multi-factor ETFs. To help in our discussion, in just a bit, we'll be joined by Jay Jacobs, Director of Research at ETF provider Global X. Global X offers nearly 50 ETFs. There are over $3 billion invested in those ETFs. And one of the areas Global X focuses on is multi-factor investing. And let me first say, I know this topic may sound a, a bit complicated, multi-factor investing. But I think as we walk through this today, uh, you'll find this isn't quite as intimidating as it sounds. There are some very compelling reasons to at least consider multi-factor strategies in your portfolio. So we're going to cover the basics today, and hopefully we'll give you enough so you can decide whether these ETFs are a good fit for you. Uh, Connor, smart beta ETFs as a whole offer sort of a hybrid between passive index-based investing and active management. They track indexes just like any index fund, but they are ultimately seeking market out performance like active funds. And investors have certainly been taking notice of these ETFs. They certainly have, Nate. Uh, ETF.com estimates that there is over half a trillion dollars currently invested in smart beta ETFs globally. And we discussed at length the long-term trend of investors pulling their money out of actively managed mutual funds and investing into ETFs. And this is part of that trend. Smart beta is a combination of low-cost, index-based investing with a kind of quasi-active management piece. But, but the key is they are rules-driven. They are not managed by an individual or a team of individuals. Smart beta is a, is a broad term, but at the core of all smart beta ETFs is a rules-based, quantitative approach to investing. And, Nate, if you don't mind, a quick note here on the actual term smart beta. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's not a term that everybody loves because there is certainly an implication that with the term, you know, smart in the name smart beta, that these strategies, you know, will always work out well or they are a fit for everybody. And that's, you know, certainly not the ta the, the case. But just to to be clear on what we're talking about, you know, this type of investing has also been called you know, strategic beta or fundamental investing or factors-based investing. But since the term smart beta seems to be here to stay, that's what we're going to use to refer to, you know, all of these rules-based ETFs that are using different methodologies to determine how to weight their holdings differently beyond simply the traditional market cap weighting. Well, that's a great point. You know, smart beta has become sort of a catch-all for all of these strategies. And, you know, some refer to it more as a, a, a marketing term within the industry. But but that's how we're going to refer to these ETFs on today's show, because that is what has been adopted by the industry to refer to these strategies. But you mentioned some ETF.com data. At the beginning of the year, one of ETF.com's big predictions for 2016 was that smart beta ETFs will attract $100 billion in inflows this year. This after $150 billion went into smart beta ETFs from 2013 through the end of last year. And there are some very big players getting involved in this space. I mentioned we'll be talking to Jay Jacobs, 
of Global X in a few moments. Global X is certainly one of those players. And then you have names like Goldman Sachs, Janice, John Hancock, and many of the largest, most established ETF players as well. iShares, State Street, PowerShares, all the big boys. As a matter of fact, right now, nearly a third of the ETFs on the market are so-called smart beta products. So this is growing into a very large category. And let's start today by explaining what smart beta is, just at a very basic level. If you think about a traditional index fund, so let's say something like the Spider S&P 500 ETF. This holds 500 of the largest U.S. stocks. And the way these stocks are weighted in the fund is simply based on the market values of the companies. In other words, if the market value of Apple is bigger than Facebook, then Apple will have a bigger weighting in the ETF compared to Facebook. And when I say market value or market cap, that's simply the share price of a company times the number of shares outstanding. So if Apple is worth $600 billion and Facebook is worth $350 billion, Apple is going to have nearly double the weight in the fund. Well, what smart beta ETFs seek to do is sever this relationship between share price and weighting in the fund. Kind of ultimately the idea is to tilt the holdings towards some other attribute or, or factor or combination of factors, something other than stock price. Right. And, and we're going to get into these factors, what that means, the different you know types of factors that there are out there with Jay Jacobs here shortly. So we're not going to you know steal his thunder. But you know another part I want to touch on real quickly is is the actual term beta because that's a technical finance term and what beta actually means is market risk or market exposure so what smart beta funds do is provide market exposure differently than simply market cap and that's the question investors are attempting to answer when using smart beta etfs you know is there a better option than market cap to get exposure to equities and, you know, this, this is what's so great about the evolution in the ETF universe, that the answer to that question can be totally different based on your specific situation. You know, a young, a young and aggressive investor might want to get equity exposure based on, you know, the high growth potential of certain stocks or, you know, uh, high momentum, while an older conservative investor might want to own companies based on how little their price moves, you know, called low volatility. And again, these are just two examples of the, you know, multitude of types of factors that can be used when using smart beta ETFs. Well, what's interesting about smart beta is if you step back and think about it, again, these ETFs are still tracking an index. The index may be built differently than a traditional market cap weighted index, but it is still an index. But there's a unique twist to this because smart beta ETFs are also active in the sense that the index they track has been arranged differently than just selecting stocks based on their market value. There, there is an active bet being made. And that's why we say these are a hybrid of both passive and active management. But here's the kicker. With smart beta ETFs, you're typically not paying the fees you would normally pay for an active manager. So I think a good point of comparison for smart beta ETFs, even though they are index-based, is not necessarily with other index funds, but instead with actively managed funds. Because ultimately, these smart beta ETFs are attempting to deliver outperformance in some fashion. It just so happens they're typically doing so at a lower cost and in a more disciplined manner. Yeah, that's a very good point. And when you do look at the data of actively managed mutual funds, We've done numerous times on our show, usually you know twice a year when that SPIVA scorecard comes out. The reality is the vast majority of actively managed mutual funds underperform their benchmarks. The reason is that these actively managed mutual funds have such high fees that they need to come over that they need to overcome each year just to get back to even, just to get you back to you know flat for the year because you start out in a hole every year because of these higher fees. So smart bait ETFs are, are still a bet on the ability of some strategy or factor to beat the overall market. But here's the key, and this is what you mentioned, Nate. These ETFs have a much better chance of doing so simply because their fees are usually so much lower than actively managed mutual funds and thus have a much smaller hurdle to overcome at the start of each year in terms of the, the fees that they have to overcome just to get the investors back to even. But you know, even putting fees aside and just looking at the investment process, 
The interesting thing about active managers is most of them do, do use a very disciplined process to select investments. They're running a, a set of screens to find stocks that fit their criteria, whatever that criteria might be. They're trying to outperform the market. Maybe they focus on companies with growing earnings or stocks that have been beaten up, so-called value stocks. Or maybe they're focused on stocks with high dividends. But if you talk to an active manager, they likely have some set of core investment beliefs and a process to find stocks to reflect those beliefs. The problem with active managers is they're all human beings, uh, just like all of us. So they're subjected to the same behavioral biases we all are. Uh, maybe they decide they don't like the stocks that come back after they run their set of screens. Maybe they have a gut feeling uh, the market is, is overvalued and going to crater. Or they see a negative headline regarding a particular company and they decide to sell prematurely. At the end of the day, an active manager is trying their best to provide out performance. But in doing so, emotions can come into play. So putting fees aside, which I think is that's a key point, the risk with traditional active managers is is perhaps they make poor judgment calls or succumb to emotion. With smart beta ETFs, the poor judgment and emotion is removed. There's not a manager reacting to hunches or, or gut feelings. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean smart beta ETFs are going to outperform. But if you think about trying to give yourself the best opportunity for outperformance, boy, lowering investment fees and removing emotion from the equation is certainly a good place to start. I think most simply what, what smart beta ETFs are is the automation of active management. Like you said, most active managers out there do have their own set of factors or beliefs that they use to try to pick stocks, you know, from deep valley to high growth, anything in between. You know, these managers do have their own set of factors that they believe in. Smart beta ETFs essentially take the same approach but remove the human emotion from that equation. Regardless of how smart these mutual fund managers are, and they are you know, for the most part, very well-educated, extremely bright individuals, they are still human. And therefore, they encounter the same emotions we all do as investors, overconfidence, recency bias, anchoring. You know, these are all well-researched and documented behaviors that we all deal with as investors. And smart beta allows those behavioral biases to be eliminated from the equation. Well, you said the automation of active management. I think that that's a very well said. You know, think about it. For better or worse, just about everything in our lives seems to be heading towards automation. I've actually seen, believe it or not, uh, automated bartenders. Uh, or just think about robots manufacturing cars, those automated assembly lines. And ask yourself, why are things automated? What's the purpose? Well, I would argue two of the biggest reasons for automation are to reduce costs and to improve quality, minimize human error. Well, no different with smart beta ETFs. I think that's ultimately the goal. Now, again, that's not to say all smart beta ETFs achieve that. Uh, there are some pricey smart beta ETFs, and there are certainly some poorly constructed ones, just like I'm sure there are some robot bartenders who might make me the wrong drink or, or overcharge me. Or sometimes a car comes off the assembly line with a defect, right? There are still lemons being manufactured. But in general, automation does tend to be a good thing. And when it comes to smart beta ETFs, you do have lower average costs. You have that discipline. You just have to be sure to do your homework and make sure you understand what it is you're investing in. Yeah, that's all, those are all very good points. And, and look, to be clear here, smart beta ETFs aren't for everyone. It depends on what you are trying to accomplish as an investor. What is important, though, is that ETFs have brought these options to the average investor. I mean, simply put, these types of strategies were not available to most investors until the last couple of years and at a fraction of the cost of their actively managed mutual fund counterparts. So, you know, while smart bait ETF might not be the right thing for you, the fact that these types of quantitative strategies are now available to everyone is a huge deal and is going to be a large factor in the continued growth of the ETF space. Look, if you're an investor who is inclined to try to find out performance, then I think smart beta could be a great place to look. And with the current low interest rate environment we're in, smart beta could also replace more expensive mutual funds in the fixed income portion of your portfolio as well. Because obviously reducing fees is, is always important. It's a tenant of our management style at the ETF store. It becomes doubly so in the fixed income space with these ultra low interest rates we're still dealing with 
seven, eight years past the financial crisis. Well, and if you just think about uh, returns from equities, you know, there are a lot who believe we're going to be in a lower return environment moving forward on the stock side. And so if you're looking for ways to perhaps find that extra return, smart beta uh, ETFs could be a place to look. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue our discussion on smart beta ETFs. We'll be joined by Jay Jacobs, Director of Research at Global X. We'll focus specifically on multi factor ETFs. So stay with us. We'll do that right after the break. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877 365 ETFS. That's 877 365 3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Business disputes are rarely just about money. Oftentimes, they involve a breach of trust or a fundamental disagreement about the terms or operation of the business. The law firm of Graves Garrett offers comprehensive and creative solutions to these types of complex legal problems. Graves Garrett represents businesses and individuals nationwide in commercial litigation, white-collar criminal defense litigation, and compliance and internal investigations. If you're involved in a critical legal dispute, let Graves Garrett be your voice. Visit GravesGarrett.com or call 816-256-3181. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements. We're always on the hunt for game changers. The iPhone, Uber, Airbnb, all revolutionary market leaders. In the financial world, the exchange-traded fund is the game changer, growing at a record pace by cutting the cost of mutual funds and helping you keep what you've worked so hard to earn. At the ETF Store, we utilize the latest technology to help you create a balanced portfolio you can monitor and, most importantly, understand. Call us today for a free consultation, 816-363-ETFS, or go to ETFstore.com. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own, human, who you are, and intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life, architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapists, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at mymassagebliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci along with Connor Kelly in studio. I'm now pleased to welcome to the program Jay Jacobs, Director of Research at Global X. If you're not familiar with Global X, they're a leading developer of very innovative ETF solutions. They currently offer nearly 50 ETFs with over $3 billion invested in those ETFs. These include everything from global dividend focused ETFs to China sector ETFs to ETFs covering the MLP space. And as I mentioned earlier, Global X does offer a suite of multi factor ETFs, which is what we'll be focusing on today. Jay Jacobs is joining us via phone from New York. Uh, Jay, a pleasure to have you on the program today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Jay, Connor and I tried to set the table for you a little bit in our first segment. We talked very high level about smart beta ETFs and how they select and weight holdings based on different factors, something other than just market cap. To start here today, can you maybe describe to our listeners what a factor is and perhaps touch on some of the more popular factors out there? Sure. So very broadly speaking, a factor is a characteristic that helps explain a group of stocks' risks and returns. 
So if you think about it, the first factor that really came out was called the market factor, which um, is more commonly considered sort of beta, a stock's beta. So a stock with a high beta is considered more sensitive to the market, and if the market is rising, that's a, that's a good factor to have. It, it should outperform. If the market is falling, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bad factor, and you could underperform. What really changed in the factor space was when Fama and French came out and said there's actually more factors than just market beta. There's size, how big a company is, and there's value, how cheap a company is. They can help explain really the risk and returns of those stocks. And not only can you explain how they perform using those factors, but you can actually see which factors are better rewarded over the long term. So they showed that value tends to outperform growth over the long term, small size tends to outperform uh, large size over the long term. So this really opened the door for other academics to come in and say, hey, there's actually other factors. Uh, low volatility is one. Momentum is another. So suddenly we started having multiple factors that could be used to help explain how stocks perform and to see which ones really can outperform over the long term. Well, Jay, what makes for a good factor? Because there are literally hundreds of factors out there where some academic will tell you the factor is capable of beating the market. What distinguishes a good factor around which to build an investment strategy? That's a great question. So a good factor is a robust one, one that will work over the long term as you expect it to. So the way you can test for this is to look across different time frames, across different geographies, even different asset classes, to see if the factor behaves as you would expect. So if it does work in you know, different decades, different regions, different asset classes, that's probably a robust factor. The problem is we have so much computing power these days that a lot of people will go factor fishing, which is looking for a factor that might not be there. So it, you do want those factors that are robust and have academic consensus. Now, many of the smart beta ETFs currently on the market are focused on a single factor, whether it be value, momentum, low volatility, some of the other ones that you mentioned. But GlobalX offers a suite of ETFs that use multiple factors. You call them scientific beta ETFs. What are some of the benefits of using a multi-factor approach versus a single-factor approach? Well, just as we said that some factors tend to outperform over the long term, they can still go through periods of underperformance that can extend for multiple years. Uh, we just saw that the value factor has underperformed for multiple-year periods. So if you were just invested in the value factor, that would not be good for your portfolio. Using multiple factors at once seeks to diversify those exposures. So even if value is underperforming, another factor like vol low volatility is doing very well. So just like you would diversify individual stocks, diversifying across factors can help smooth out the ride. Now, you mentioned diversification, uh, which obviously is a good thing. I, I guess just playing devil's advocate, you know, I might be concerned that if you combine multiple factors, you could end up with performance and risk characteristics pretty much in line with a traditional low-cost market cap weighted index fund. How do you avoid this when you're combining multiple factors? It really comes down to the construction of the index methodology. You're right in saying that if you look at a multi-factor index, it will hold many stocks. Our scientific beta U.S. fund owns 480 of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500. But what it comes down to is how those stocks are weighted. So um, if you look at the active share, which is essentially the difference between our portfolio and the S&P 500, there's only a 50% overlap by weight. So even though we're owning many of the same stocks, we're tilting towards those stocks that have better value characteristics, better momentum characteristics. And you will see over time that that is the difference between a cap-weighted portfolio and one that is trying to get uh, factor exposure. We're visiting with Jay Jacobs, Director of Research at Global X. Jay, let's talk a little bit more about the Global X suite of multi-factor ETFs. They're called Scientific Beta ETFs. Uh, there are four ETFs covering the U.S., Europe, Asia X, Japan, and, and then Japan. Can you tell us more about these ETFs, uh, maybe the factors used, and just high level how they're, how they're constructed? Sure, absolutely. So each of these funds are constructed in a very similar manner. The only difference is the region they're trying to get exposure to. And they are accessing four factors at once, the value factor, the size factor, low volatility, and momentum. These are factors that have very broad uh, academic consensus out there for being robust factors. 
And the way they're constructed is really um, sort of a very template approach where it's creating four separate indexes, each targeting one factor at a time, and then combining those four indexes together for the multi-factor approach. I know that can sound a little complicated, but really what it's trying to do is, is use a very standardized approach to accessing all the factors and then get that diversified multi-factor approach at the end. So, Jay, just boiling it down, if you were to compare uh, perhaps your U.S. scientific beta ETF to a a standard S&P 500 uh, ETF, how should I expect that to perform? What what, what are the general risk uh, return characteristics of the scientific beta ETF? Well, as I mentioned, we're owning 480 of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500. So it's a very broad approach. There isn't a ton of tracking error between the S&P 500 and our portfolio, but you will see in some periods multiple factors will not work. So there could be periods of underperformance. In other periods, factors are working, and you'll see periods of of outperformance. But in general, because we're taking such a broad approach, it really can be used as sort of like a core holding uh, that will perform as you would expect a large-cap fund to perform. Jay, this is Connor Kelly. A quick follow-up on this with the four factors you guys are using, is, is it static between the four? I mean, is it, you know, did the or based on factors performing well or, or performing poorly, do you guys, you know, tactically change the weight in each of those four factors within these ETFs? That's a great question. So on a quarterly basis, the weights across those four factors can change. What we're trying to do is tilt towards the factors that have the least tracking error to the S&P 500. So basically, if we're in sort of a value market, we're going to tilt more towards the value factor. This should reduce the overall tracking error of the strategy. So it will perform more like a cap-weighted benchmark like the S&P 500. So, so Jay, for listeners out there, why should investors consider multi-factor strategies? You mentioned that these particular ETFs, they may serve uh, as nice core holdings. uh, But but why consider multi-factor strategies? Sure, it's really for investors that are looking for outperformance over the long term. I, you know, we're in an environment right now where GDP growth is slowing across developed nations. We're in a very mature state for many industries. So growth is something that's hard to come by. And outperformance is one way of trying to achieve growth that might not necessarily come there from just owning a cap-weighted benchmark over the next decade. Again, we're visiting with Jay Jacobs, Director of Research at Global X. Jay, as it relates to performance, you know, we've all seen studies showing where smart beta strategies will have unbelievable back-tested performance, but once they go live, the performance isn't always there. Uh, is there a concern that once these strategies are packaged up and, and brought to the mass market, they no longer work, that either there is data mining involved in the back testing or, or that the advantage simply gets arbitraged away once these products are available to everyone? I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question, and it comes back to the robustness of the factor. If it's a true robust factor, it should work over the long term. This is where people get in trouble, though, because they have so much computing power that they can look back and try to refine factors or find a new factor that may not truly be robust. So when they package that up and put it in an ETF, suddenly, hey, it stops working. If it were a robust factor, that wouldn't be the case. Well, I think that's a great point. And, you know, with all the smart beta ETFs available to investors, whether we're talking single factor ETFs or or multi-factor strategies, uh, you know, there are a lot of ETFs for the average investor to digest. What do you think are some of the key things investors should look at before deciding to invest in a smart beta ETF? Investors really need to do their homework. Um, there's, there's obviously many products out there. One of the things investors should do is look at the methodology for the product. Um, if you just look at the top-level marketing, you'll see you know, a lot of the same factors are out there, a lot of the same sort of marketing uh, words such as outperformance or lower risk. But you really have to dig in and see what factors are they accessing, how are they defining those factors, uh, and how are they combining them at the end of the day. Jay, we always advise people that if you're going to use smart beta ETFs, such as your multi-factor ETFs, it's important to let them work over time. In other words, if you think about uh, something like value or momentum, those factors aren't going to outperform every single year. There, There will be ups and downs along the way, and the potential for outperformance comes over a much longer period of time. Do you agree with that approach? Yeah, that's exactly right. A long-term approach definitely makes sense for factor investing. 
One of the reasons why these factors are rewarded is because many investors don't have the patience to invest in them. If it was a short-term, consistent outperformance every day that you can count on, that would be arbitraged away. The fact that it takes many years for value to express itself and it can go through various ups and downs is exactly why it's a rewarded factor. Jay, it's Connor again. Why? How did you guys settle on all four factors? You know, and my question is, you know, if if this is a long term approach, what did your guys' research show? Was it better to just simply have exposure to one of these robust factors, like momentum, like low volatility? And do you achieve superior outperformance over the long term, but with, you know, higher risk, higher volatility in the short term? I mean, explain why you guys settled on using all four. Sure. So we partnered with the EdHec Risk Institute, which is a business school out of uh, France. And they've really done a lot of research in the space as to what factors are robust and, and how it makes sense to combine them. So If you just invested in the value factor and held on to it for 40 years, sure, you could have great performance, but with greater risk. By combining these four factors, it's really trying to get at risk-adjusted returns. So by holding these four factors, we're limiting uh, the the underperformance that can persist for a few years um, and and trying to diversify across different, uh, different across factors. All right, Jay, we have uh, just a few minutes left here. Before we let you go, I have to ask you about a new ETF Global X launch uh, last week, the Global X S&P 500 Catholic Values ETF. The ticker on that is C-A-T-H, uh, great ticker. This is a so-called socially conscious ETF, perhaps the exact opposite uh, of the uh, SIN indexes that are out there. Can you tell us about this ETF and, and perhaps why Global X decided to launch it? Sure. So we've seen a lot of popularity recently in SRI investing or values-based investing where investors want to put their money behind an idea rather than just an asset class. Uh, Investing can be very impersonal to many people. You're just trying to make money off of money. But if you can put it behind something that, that matters to you, then you can get some sort of additional utility out of that investment. This was actually specifically a, a strategy that came to us from a client who was trying to do Catholic investing on an individual stock level and found that it would be uh, more cost efficient, more tax efficient to wrap it up into an ETF. So we worked with S&P Dow Jones to create an index that would really uh, sort of achieve their goal of Catholic values-based investing in the cost-effective, tax-efficient wrapper of an ETF. Do you think we'll see more of of these types of ETF uh, products being launched over the next several years, just in the socially conscious arena? Absolutely. In the institutional space, there are trillions of dollars investing in, you know, SRI values-based investing. In the ETF world, it's still relatively small. So I believe there'll be many more products and more assets coming to the space. Well, Jay, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Fantastic discussion today. You know, Smart Beta, this is a a fast-growing segment of ETFs. We certainly appreciate your insights. There's a lot for investors to to walk through and and, and understand in this space. So we certainly appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. That was Jay Jacobs, Director of Research at Global X. And you can learn all about the Global X lineup of ETFs by visiting globalxfunds.com. That's globalxfunds.com. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have a quick market update, and we'll also spotlight one of the Global X scientific beta ETFs. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877 365 3837 or visit etfstore.com. For many, owning a home is the American dream. And at Stonegate Mortgage, we play an important role in helping you achieve that dream. So whether you're buying a new home or refinancing your existing one, choose a company that puts a face and a firm handshake behind every deal. The American dream lives on at Stonegate Mortgage. Call Tim Noyce, 913-717-4111. Stonegate Mortgage Corporation, NMLS number 186732. Tim Noyce, NMLS number 415086. Stonegate Mortgage is not licensed to originate loans in Hawaii and New York. Equal housing lender. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. 
When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. If you, a family member, or maybe someone you know have been the victim of someone else's negligence, whether due to a motor vehicle collision, an accident at work, a slip and fall, or a product defect, you may be entitled to compensation under the law. The law firm of Van Zanten and Onick is exclusively dedicated to representing victims of negligence in Kansas and Missouri. Please call 816-479-0404 today for a free consultation. Again, 816-479-0404. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. Do stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. Welcome back to the ETS Store Show. Nate and Connor in studio. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. A mixed week for stocks last week. The S&P 500 was up about a half of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up nearly two-thirds of a percent. But the Nasdaq was down one and a half percent. Following some disappointing earnings from larger tech companies like Microsoft and Alphabet. Now, this week, investors will be focusing on the Fed, which releases its policy statement tomorrow. And while the market isn't expecting a rate increase, everyone will certainly be watching to see if there's any change in language that may hint at what the Fed is planning for the remainder of the year. The Bank of Japan will also release their policy statement this week. That will be on Thursday. And, Connor, we're going to spotlight a Japanese stock ETF in our next segment. And I came across something over the weekend relating to Japanese stocks that absolutely floored me. Listen to this. This was from Bloomberg. Right now, it's estimated the Bank of Japan is a top 10 shareholder in about 90% of the Nikkei 225 stock average. Let me say that again. Right now, the Bank of Japan is a top 10 shareholder in about 90% of the Nikkei 225 stock average. In layman terms, what's been happening is the Bank of Japan has been creating money out of thin air and using that money to buy ETFs and other assets. And through those purchases, they've been so massive, they're now a top 10 shareholder in over 200 of Japan's blue chip stocks. That's just mind-blowing. Boy, this this is um, hard to get your head around. It really it, is. For all the actions of the Fed over the past you know, seven or eight years, you know, three rounds of quantitative easing or, or QE and ultra-low interest rates for, for seven years now, I mean, they've never reached the point of intervention of buying U.S. stocks. I mean, this is simply insane to be a top-ten shareholder – 
in 90% of what is essentially Japan's S&P 500. I mean, think about that. When you look at the top 10 shareholders of of large cap U.S. stocks, they're almost always very large mutual funds, ETFs, pensions. And for the Bank of Japan to have elbowed their way into the top 10 essentially across the board is truly mind-blowing. Well, it's interesting in the Bloomberg article, they said that the Bank of Japan now holds more than Vanguard and BlackRock, the world's two largest uh, fund Fund managers. Wow. I mean, at the current pace, to put, put some numbers on this, at the current pace, the Bank of Japan is buying roughly three trillion yen worth of their essentially blue chip stocks each year. And Nate, you mentioned this for a second. They're doing it primarily through ETFs, which is obviously a different, you know, uh, unique side note, but something we should discuss. That you know, from an efficiency standpoint, low cost perspective, obviously the Bank of Japan came to the realization that ETFs is the best way for them to to get this you know, uh, ownership of their stock market, which obviously we found very interesting. The question is, why are they doing this? They're trying to stimulate demand for their country's products. They're trying to get consumers to feel what's called the wealth effect. If stock prices increase, investors feel more wealthy because they see their statements and everything's worth more. They, they, They are more willing to spend more money. The issue is that nobody including the Bank of Japan or any other central bank for that matter, has any idea what the long-term implications are going to be for this type of intervention. I mean, you you can't in good faith call what is happening in Japan a, a free market right now. Well, they're also trying to drive down the yen as well, right? If, if the yen goes down in value, that makes the, the country's exports cheaper around the globe. So by creating this money out of thin air and buying assets, you know, hopefully inter- injecting more uh, you know, currency into the economy, that's going to drive down the value. But, you know, the promise is not working. Not the working continues right now. to strengthen and strengthen because as people around the world continue to become more scared, the yen is a safe haven. So money's flowing in the yen and it's getting stronger, which is the opposite of what all of the stimulation of the Bank of Japan is doing is trying to do. Well, and that goes back to your point, you know, we, how does this all play out? And, you know, the issue to me is price discovery because in normally functioning markets, investors will weigh risk and return and then decide where to invest their money based on that. Here we have a central bank just blindly buying stocks and other assets. So you have to ask yourself whether valuations may become distorted if they haven't already, because it's not like the Bank of Japan is analyzing corporate fundamentals and and then deciding where to invest based on the best opportunity. Uh, But in any event, the Bank of Japan meets Thursday. Bloomberg said a majority of analysts they surveyed expected the Bank of Japan to increase their ETF buying. And if they did, listen to this, they could become the number one shareholder, the number one shareholder in 40 of the Nikkei 225 by the end of 2017. So this will be something to watch moving forward. This isn't necessarily a negative. You know, look, you may be able to take advantage and ride right alongside the Bank of Japan if these stocks are going up. But this is certainly something to be aware of. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll spotlight a Global X multi-factor ETF holding Japanese stocks. This is the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Hi, this is Ryan Wiebe, owner of First Mortgage Solutions. If you've heard news lately about low interest rates and want to know if now is the time to buy a new home or even refinance the one you've got, give one of my experienced loan consultants a call at 816-778-7000. If you're too busy to call right now, just go to firstmortgagekc.com and fill out a full online application. Last year, we saved our average refinance customer over $457 a month on their monthly bills. First Mortgage Solutions, 816-778-7000. The Weeby Group, LLC, Kansas License, MC002500009, Equal Housing Lender. The U.S. economy is often referred to as a competitive marketplace, yet many Americans don't understand the parameters of this competition. Why is it that so many people don't understand a subject that is so important to their daily lives? The simple answer is nobody ever taught them. The Missouri Council on Economic Education exists in order to right this wrong by promoting economic and financial education in Missouri. To learn more about our efforts and to get involved, 
please visit missouri.councilforeconed.org. You want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need J Girl Media. J Girl Media is a full scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. This segment is brought to you by the Bushnell Factory Outlets, offering big savings on a variety of brands such as Primos, Tasco, Hoppies, Bole, and more. Stop by either of our stores located in Lenexa, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, and let our expert sales associates help you with your purchases. The Bushnell Factory Outlet Stores serve as your destination to purchase the most extensive assortment of Bushnell brand of products anywhere in the United States. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nature Racy and Connor Kelly in studio. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,800 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all, so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Global X Scientific Beta Japan ETF. The ticker symbol on that is SCIJ. This offers exposures to stocks in the MSCI Japan Index with a twist, it seeks to outperform this market cap weighted index by providing exposure to stocks that focus on four factors, value, momentum, size, and low volatility. Counter, this particular ETF caught my attention because a big theme over the past few years has been currency hedging, especially currency hedge Japan ETFs. Now, this ETF doesn't hedge its currency exposure, but GlobalX actually makes the case this ETF provides a better risk return profile. Uh, and they explain how over the long run, currency exposure, it, it doesn't add or subtract to your returns. It's not a source of long-term performance. So if you want outperformance over the long run, why not focus on factors that have historically shown that ability? And that's exactly what this ETF is attempting to do. Uh, GlobalX says that hedging the yen has resulted in higher volatility and greater drawdowns due to the negative correlation between the yen and Japanese large-cap stocks. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense because large-cap companies in Japan include big exporters like uh, Toyota. So if the yen appreciates, that makes Toyotas more expensive around the globe, which could hurt Toyota sales and earnings. Smaller-cap companies tend to have sales tied more to domestic demand than exports. And size, of course, is one of the factors in the CTF. So it's varying more small-cap 
than the traditional large cap heavy uh, MSCI Japan index. But, you know, plus you have these other key factors uh, in play here, which we walked through with Jay Jacobs earlier. It, it, look, Nate, it's an, it's an interesting ETF. It, it gives you exposure to 400 Japanese stocks, and the expense ratio is just 0.38%, which is really pretty darn inexpensive considering this is an international equity ETF plus the factors that are being used in determination of, of what stocks you own. Now, regarding the, you know the case that Global X makes against currency hedging is certainly it's an interesting one that over the long term it doesn't result in outperformance. So why focus on it? And it also should be said there's a cost when you currency hedge. Now it's it's very inexpensive right now with this low interest rate environment, but there is a cost to hedging currencies. So. You know, the question comes down to what you think is going to, you know, likely to happen as an investor because, you know, we just spent the market update talking about the the crazy measures the Bank of Japan are embarking on that, you know, if you do think that the BOJ's focus on, on monetary easing is going to result in a yen that gets weaker, you know, over the near term, over the next couple of years, then a currency hedge ETF like DXJ could be the right answer for you. However... Looking over the long term, Global X does make a strong case that currency hedging doesn't add any real value, that, in fact, it can add volatility. So, you know, you should focus on factors that can add return over the long haul, such as value, momentum, uh, small size, and obviously uh, low volatility. So it, it, it's a, certainly a compelling well thought out ETF by the guys at Global X. You know, though, the key to me, what you just said there, was long term, because because the key to any ETF like this is thinking long term. If you use these smart beta strategies, and really this goes for any type of investment right. strategy, you have to let them work. If you think about small caps or momentum, those factors aren't going to outperform every single year. There will be ups and downs along the way. And, and really the potential for outperformance comes over a much longer period of time. Think about value investing, which I believe Jay hit on earlier. Mm -hmm. it, it can lag the broader market for long periods of time. It has over the past several years, but it can also significantly outperform as well. But, but over longer periods of time, you can scoop up that value premium. I just think that's an important point to make. And, you know, it's very difficult trying to time investing in specific factors. It's almost impossible. And Jay made the very good point that, you know, these these so-called, in his words, robust factors, you know, they do work. But it it takes a long-term approach for them to play out. I mean, you need to own these factors over a full business cycle. You know, if you like the idea, if you believe in it, you need to commit to it. This is not going to work if you're trying to time the market and zip in and zip out of these funds based on short-term gut feelings about what could happen in the near term because that is a recipe for failure. You know, something else that I think we should point out, and this isn't really specific to this particular ETF we're, we're spotlighting. I think this goes for, for any smart beta ETF, any ETF that's doing something other than market cap weighting. You do have to uh, take the back-tested returns that they put out there uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, you, you know, many of these attributes that the ETFs are attempting to capture to drive out performance are cyclical. So the back-tested returns look great. A, a new ETF rolls out right after the factor or factors have outperformed just in time for that factor to go out of favor. It, you know, it's always easy to look back and see what outperformed, uh, build an ETF around that and, 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 and market it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to outperform moving forward. And and I guess my point of going through that is, one, you know, again, you have to do your homework with any any smart beta strategy. But if you are going to invest in a smart beta strategy, to our earlier point, you have to take that long-term approach and let the factors work over the long run. You know, in, in the amount of work you need to do as an investor with smart beta versus just traditional plain vanilla market cap ETFs is significant, right? I mean, if you just want exposure to the S&P 500, there's going to be several large, well-traded ETFs that will provide that without an issue. Smart beta is complicated. And, you know, I, I love the term that Jay used, the factor fishing. That was great. Right? Yeah. There, there are already a third of all ETFs are smart beta. And the reality is all the plain vanilla indexes are already covered. 
So the majority of new ETFs that are going to be issued are going to be some sort of smart beta ETF in a lot of situations. So the the importance of doing your homework, understanding how these ETFs actually work, the factors that they're using, et cetera, is so important if you're not going to get burned. Because the reality is there are going to be poorly constructed ones. There are going to be ones that are too expensive. And the factor fishing um, is certainly going to come into play where, you know, the, the, the data crunching finds a factor that might not be real. Well, we have a very simple rule for any investment. Uh, if you don't understand it, don't invest in it. It's really that simple. All right, we'll have to leave it there as we are out of time for today's show. I want to thank Jay Jacobs of Global X for joining us on the program today. Don't forget that you can listen to any of our guest interviews by visiting our ETF expert corner at ETFstore.com. Full podcasts of the ETF Store show are also available at ETFstore.com, along with iTunes and Google Play. Check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store show. Next week, we have another great guest for you. We'll be joined by Matt Tucker, head of iShares Fixed Income Strategy. We'll be talking about the current bond market, and we'll also highlight several iShares bond ETFs. So be sure to join us. That's next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Until then, have a great week, everyone.